Make sure you put on your sunglasses so you look cool at the card pool. I'm your host, Kyle Robertson. And I'm Stu Galetta. And today we're talking about the top 10 hidden gems of Fifth Dawn. This is part one of our two-part set review. The following will be the top 10 money cards that we find in Fifth Dawn. But without further ado, let's start the review. All right, let's get right into it. I'm going to start off my list at my number 10 with a pretty unassuming little card, but one that's become a personal staple of mine. It's called Wayfarer's Bauble. It is an artifact. It costs one mana to play. It has a very simple ability. You tap two mana and tap it to sacrifice it, and you get to search your deck for a basic land and put it onto the battlefield tapped. Like I said, this card has kind of become a personal favorite and staple of mine as a way to start off the mana curve in pretty much any deck, given the fact that it's a colorless artifact, you can play it in pretty much any deck. It's also searchable in a number of ways, not least of which is another favorite card of mine, which is way up on the list that we'll get to later. I just think while there may be other more expensive and better options to start things off, let's say a Soul Ring, for example, or a Mana Crypt or a Mana Vault or anything like that crazy stuff, I think Wayfarer's Bauble is a very nice budget option, and not only that, it's just a pretty nice card overall. You play it first turn, sacrifice it second turn, you're a land up that gives you four lands on turn three, more than likely. Not a bad way to start off the game. I love this card. I've used this card. I see people use this card. And it does a very key thing in the game, which is ramp. Now, notably, green is the dominant color that makes it so that it can put more lands in with great ease. So for other decks or other colors that have trouble with this, uh, the biggest one that I can think of are Boros decks. This makes it so that your biggest problem is getting lands out, this answers it, and it answers it by getting you whatever color you need. If you have a lot of red cards in your hand and you only have a plains or an island or a swamp, put this into play, crack it the following turn, and adjust your mana where you need to see fit. It's, it's really good for fixing your curve, smoothing out your gameplay, and making it so that you can have a fighting chance. So moving away from artifacts and into enchantments, I have on my list for number 10 an enchantment called Ion Storm. It costs two colorless and a red, and what it reads is, for one colorless and a red, remove a plus one one counter or a charge counter from a permanent you control. Ion Storm deals two damage to target creature or player. Now the reason why this made my list is this is a card that you really don't see a lot of in red. And the reason why I'm doing this is it's controlled hate. Now normally red uses stuff like Blasphemous Act, which hits everything, or it's focusing energy at like particular targets, like we see with like Lightning Bolt, for example. But this is something that utilizes the field and can direct damage where need be. So for example, if you're running a deck that loves plus one one counters, you can now utilize that in a whole new way. If your opponent goes and boards wipes, normally you would just lose the 1-1 one, one counters and making it so all the work that you put together just goes for nothing. But in this case, you're actually able to utilize that just in the off chance that something is going to happen horribly wrong. Yeah, this is a very interesting card, especially because red doesn't really get to play with counters a lot. More often, the charge counters, because charge counters go on artifacts and red can do some artifact-related shenanigans. But playing with plus one, plus one counters, that's something that I really don't see red getting to do all that often. The only thing that kind of holds me back on this card is that, well, one, you have to play it in a deck where you use a lot of counters of that kind. But also, two mana for two damage and losing a counter may not exactly be a great return on investment it does do damage to a creature or a player, which gives this card a lot of versatility. So, hey, maybe it's something you want to consider. Going off the theme of doing damage here, I actually am going to go to a rather large creature here with an interesting ability. So, my number nine is Methodros Vampire. This is a black creature. It is a vampire, as the name suggests. It costs six mana, four and double black. It's a three-four. It has flying. And it has another ability as well, which is each creature you control is a vampire in addition to its other types, and also gains the ability to, whenever it does combat damage, it gets a plus one plus one counter. This is a kind of cool card. The reason it made my list is just because of how interesting I think it is. One of the cards that this reminds me of and that we've talked about before in these segments is Conspiracy, the older card where you got to choose what creature type all your creatures would be. Obviously, this doesn't have the same kind of flexibility because it just makes all your creatures vampires. 
but it can be relevant on a tribal basis because vampires is kind of a relevant and good tribe. The other thing that this adds is a lot of the vampires out there have this same ability, which is whenever it does damage to a, a creature or a player, put a plus one plus one counter on it. It's kind of changed as the years go by. This do damage to a creature is kind of the older version of vampirism, but it's a pretty interesting one. Because assuming those creatures do damage to other creatures, this plus one plus one counter gets added on them, and they may not die if they were going to die before. And if they didn't die just from getting chump blocked or something, they're just going to get even bigger. The stats on Methadros Vampire aren't exactly that intimidating, but remember, he does give himself this ability as well, so maybe that ups his estimation a little bit. And also don't forget that if you have multiple copies of this in play at the same time, the ability stacks. So it just gets better and better the more of this kind of effect you have in play. I like this card, Kyle, but I can see it being not a friend to every deck. Now, I do like the, how it has the Lord effect. So it makes it so all your creatures do get some sort of plus. Now, usually when we see some kind of Lord effect or Anthem effect, it usually has to be for the exact same creature type. This has the ability to fully get beyond that. Also, by being able to turn creatures into vampires, it makes it so that some tribal strategies that didn't exist before or certain combo plays that didn't exist before are now a possibility. So if you're using Olivia Voldaren, this would be a card that you would love to put in it. It makes it so you can have greater synergies. It makes it so that you can have a greater advantage. And also, this then becomes a target. Like, your opponent's going to have to remove this. So if you had something else on the field that was, you know, kind of a bigger problem, they're in between of which one's better to get rid of. And being able to make them forcibly play a card like that is value. I think the later Necropolis region kind of does this ability one better. But overall... Kind of a fun card, a nice riff on the whole conspiracy thing, and just an interesting one that I think doesn't get as much attention as it probably deserves. Well, moving away from one card to another that might make some people scratch their heads, my number nine slot goes to a creature called Razormane Masticore. Now, it's an artifact creature that costs five. It has first strike, and at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice it unless you discard a card from your hand. In addition, at the beginning of your draw step, you may have this card deal three damage to target creature. So the reason I really like it is for the second effect. It gives you a continual lightning bolt as long as you are able to keep this card on the field, which is really, really awesome. It makes it so that for no cards, you're able to continually ping things. And one of the things that you may know or may not know is lightning bolts kind of like the test to see if a card is strong or not. Like if you can bolt something, then it means like, all right, it's pretty easy to get removed. And there's tons and tons of creatures that only have three defense. So being able to have this guy stay out there and constantly keep pinging things is great. A lot of you might say discarding a card from your hand is not good. And, you know, I can side with you on that. However... There are decks that like to discard things. Horde of Notions is an elemental-based guy where all elementals in your grave have continual value. There are certain niches where it's good, but as a standalone, I really enjoy this card. Yeah, certainly a 5-5 five, five for 5 with First Strike that requires no colors and can go into any deck is nothing to sneeze at. I also do like the second ability. I think you're right in that it can really help remove some problem utility creatures and otherwise... Of course, it only dealing damage to other creatures and not players is sort of a drawback in my opinion. But I'm glad you talked about it because I was going to say, you really shouldn't ignore the first half of this ability either. The requirement to discard a card from your hand every turn can definitely and easily be turned to your own advantage. And so I think on all sides, this card could potentially make a lot of decks very happy. Well, this card may do everything, but I'm going to go to my number eight now on this list, a card that really is only good for one thing, and I think that one thing becomes very clear once you see the card. It's called Relentless Rats. Again, another black creature for me. It costs three to play. It costs one and double black. It's a 2-2, two -two, and it has the ability that Relentless Rats gets plus one, plus one for every other creature on the battlefield named Relentless Rats. Now you may think, oh great, the max it can be is a 5-5 five five or 6-6, six six, or hey, if you even clone this thing, maybe it could be a little better than that. But no, 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 no. Read the rest of the card. A deck can have any number of cards named Relentless Rats. There are actually a couple 
of cards that have been made over the years that have this kind of ability where you can have any number of them in your deck and not just the four card limit. But unless I'm very much mistaken, I think Relentless Rats was the first one to do it. Although it's not quite as well known as the later Shadowborn Apostle. However, Relentless Rats can be, as I'm sure it kind of goes without saying, a really powerful card. There are some niche combo decks that are mostly just for fun, but can be really dumb with this card, like the Thrumming Stone Relentless Rats combo, where you give them all Ripple. And really, if you get a large number of Relentless Rats in play, it can end the game really quickly. It's not really anything other than a vanilla beater, but Rat is kind of a relevant creature type as well. It has some niche tribal support. I mostly pick this card for the fact that it breaks one of the cardinal rules of the game, which is you can have more than four copies in a deck. And to me, that's just really cool. I have to agree with you. And yeah, this card just came shy of making my list. The fact that you can have more than one of it is definitely notable because there's a lot of decks that would love to have multiple copies. So in Commander, it's a singleton format. So being able to have cards that are the same thing does give you value. Now, if there are degenerate combos that you can do to go infinite and win games with this card. So the fact that it exists definitely gives you an indication of how valuable this card can be in the right deck. Now, moving to another creature, my number eight is going to a card. Now, forgive me if I'm saying it wrong, but I think it's pronounced Ophi Vandals. It costs two colorless and a green, and it is a 2-2 creature. And it reads, for one green, you can sacrifice Ophi Vandals, counter target activate ability from an artifact source, and destroy that artifact if it's in play. The reason why this card is on my list is it's very, very interesting to see in green an ability that counters something and destroys it. And it's an artifact nonetheless. Now, a lot of decks run artifacts. Equipments, Nev's Disc is the board wide that's an artifact. And I mean, if you look at it, even commanders, there's tons of commanders that are artifacts. Brea being the most notably as the newest one. Now, whenever an activate ability goes off from an artifact, it makes it so that it counters it and destroys it. You're talking anything that you really, really want. And this creature can just sit there and last for as long as you need it to be. So if somebody's going to equip Lightning Greaves, you can stop it. If somebody's going to use Nev's Disc to blow up the field, you can stop it. And that ability in green is very, very unusual. And it may not be the most powerful card, but it's definitely one of the more unusual ones I've definitely seen. Yeah, this is a very interesting and green, wow, very bizarre riff on Stifle, which of course counters activated abilities. The kind of ability like that to counter activated abilities is a lot rarer than something that says counter target spell. You don't see countering of abilities all that much really, but on this card in particular it's quite good because as you pointed out, Stu, in a lot of cases these abilities can be sort of weak because you can do whatever you have to do to counter an activated ability and then your opponent just kind of laughs it off and says, oh well if you're going to stop it I'll just use it again. And with the Lightning Greaves example, a cost of zero equip, you're never really going to stop them. This card stops those kind of repeatable activated abilities dead in their tracks by then destroying the card. Of course, if they could still activate the ability at instant speed, that might end up being an issue. But especially something sorcery speed like equipments, this is its worst enemy. And it can be useful in a lot of other situations other than that as well. I'm not really sure how many people would really play this in a deck, but it could definitely be a role player. That's for sure. I like it. All right, well, let's go from Artifact Hate back to Artifact Love, actually, because my number seven card on my list of hidden gems here is Salvaging Station. Now, this is an artifact with a hefty mana cost of six, but I think you'll agree that the payoff is worth it. You can simply tap it, to return target non-creature artifact with a converted mana cost of one or less from your graveyard to play. And it has the additional ability that whenever a creature is put into a graveyard from play, you can untap Salvaging Station. In block with the rest of the Mirrodin-related cards, and even later with the Scars of Mirrodin block as well, the card that this is best friends with is the Spellbomb Cycle. Those little one-mana artifacts that sacrifice themselves in order to generate some kind of spell-like ability. Now, there are plenty of other cards that you can use these with. This card just offers a lot of possibilities, and 
you may look at it at first and say, one or less, you know, how much is this really going to do for me? But think about it. It can return Wayfarer's baubles. It can return the spell bombs, like I said. It can even get things back that you might have thrown away earlier, like a Relic of Progenitus that didn't get exiled, for example. There are a lot of good artifacts out there that cost one or less mana, actually, that this card can make repeatable use of. And of course, the catch that whenever a creature is put into a graveyard from play, Keep in mind, it doesn't just say your creatures, it could be anybody's creature. This creates kind of a loop in some cases with a card like Executioner's Capsule, for example, where you can just destroy a creature with it, then return it with Salvaging Station, destroy another creature, possibly return it again, and there's, there's a whole cycle of these things with the Salvaging Station, Grinding Station, and Blasting Station all of which have this similar kind of effect, although, personally, I like Salvaging Station the best. Great card, very niche, but a powerful artifact nonetheless. Another really amusing thing that you can do with this is use one of the handful of cards that make artifacts that are not creatures into creatures, like Sidri, the original Karn, those kind of cards. March of the Machines is another one, for example, that make your non-creature artifacts into creatures. So that way, when they sacrifice themselves in any fashion, the fact that they are creatures automatically triggers the salvaging station to bring them back again. Now, moving towards number seven for another powerful artifact. Now, this is one of my personal favorites. I love using it when I have the opportunity. It's called Door to Nothingness, and it costs five mana. It's an artifact, like I said, and it comes into play tap. And for two of every color, so we're talking ten mana, you tap it, and you sacrifice it, and then target player loses the game. That blows my mind. Literally for 10 mana, you can be like, all right, you've done way too much. I don't like this anymore. Goodbye, and I'll see you later. It's so powerful just because of how simple and elegant it is. If somebody plays Door to Nothingness and it comes into play tapped, that's an instant like pin drop sound. Like Everyone gets quiet. They're like, I don't have an answer. I, I could be dead. I, I, I don't know what to do. Like I'm, I'm going to have to do a top deck. It's got the same kind of dread that when you play Nevenroll's disc, people look at it and they're like, yeah, who wants to be my friend and take that out? I'll be willing to make any deal right now. The power on this card is very obvious. Now, granted, you have to have 10 mana and it has to be all five colors. So it makes it so it can be hard to play, but there are tons of ways to get through this. Prismatic Omen, Chromatic Lantern, Joiner Adept. All easy ways to make it so your mana can be fixed to whatever colors you need them to be. So if you can get the game to last long enough or ramp hard enough to have 10 mana, this is really easy to use. Also keep in mind that the fact that it comes into play tapped doesn't mean it's just going to sit there and do nothing necessarily. There are tons of ways to untap artifacts by doing relatively simple things, so this could potentially even be activated the turn that it comes into play. And as you said, Stu, it is a lot of text box there, and that amount of mana looks like a lot, but if you're playing a deck that has access to all five colors, and just the wealth of options that that gives you for mana generation, getting two mana of each color for ten mana total is definitely possible. It's very doable, I've had this happen to me a number of times, and... It doesn't even exile itself, it just sacrifices itself, so you can bring it back from the grave and do this all over again. Now, going to another artifact as my number six on this list, we have a creature, and it's called Silent Arbiter. It is a four-mana creature. No more than one creature can attack each combat, and no more than one creature can block each combat, and it is a 1-5, so it's pretty good on the defense itself, which is kind of what it's meant to do. If you look at this card on the face of it, I like it because it really has two different functions, one subtle and one not so subtle. The not so subtle one is that, as it kind of suggests the flavor of this card, this is very good on the defense, very good defensive stats, and the fact that no more than one creature can attack each combat, any player, including yourself, makes this a very useful multiplayer politics sort of card, and something that just stops a massive offense that so many decks like to use dead in their tracks. However, if you look a little closer at this card and think about it on a little deeper level, there are lots of ways to abuse the hell out of this card and use it to your own personal advantage. I personally take a giant creature like Kozilek the Great Distortion, for example, which is a 12-12 with Menace, 
Now, of course, Menace is an ability that makes a creature unblockable unless it's blocked by two or more creatures. With a card like Silent Arbiter in play, it becomes impossible to block with more than one creature. Thus, Menace creatures are essentially unblockable. There's a lot of other ways you can use this card in that sort of way to your own advantage as well. Definitely. It, it has a lot of similar effects that you see in Magic, Crawl Space being one that's very similar to this. And you would definitely use this card in a deck where, like, you're not using very many creatures. So, like, a Super Friends deck, for example, would love to put this guy in to make it so, all right, if I have two or three Planeswalkers out, that only one of them can get attacked. So this way I can slow the damage that's coming in. And like you said, there are ways around this. If you have Menace, or if you have something else that makes it so, like, a creature can't be blocked. Going from something that can be offensive to something that's better defensive. So I have here at my number six spot a card called Plunge into Darkness. It costs one colorless and one black, and it's an instant. And it has two options, and you choose one. First one being, sacrifice any number of creatures. You gain three life for each sacrificed creature. Or the following effect, pay X life, and then look at the top X cards of your library. Put one of those cards into your hand, and remove the rest from the game. And lastly, it has Entwine, so for one more mana, being black, you can do both. Now, the reason I like this card so, so much is it's more of a response to when somebody is doing something. If they're going to go ultimate and win the game, you need to find an answer right then, and it has to be now. But also, if you don't have a lot of life, it makes it so you have a way to gain a lot of life. If somebody's about to board wipe, and you can't do a response to that, like your creatures are going to die, why not get some more value out of it? That's why you see a lot of sacrifice outlets in decks to make sure you get additional value. So that's what makes it so great or good, for example, is so good. If somebody's going to make you lose your creatures, you definitely want to get the value you can out of them. But especially being able to do both, it really makes it so no matter what, no matter at any point of the game, you can use this card to hopefully save you. And I love this. Yeah, I like this card a lot too, Stu. I was actually thinking about putting this card on my list as well. It almost made it. It also frequently almost makes it into a lot of the decks that I build, but just never quite seems to make the cut. The reason being, though, that it's, I mean, it, not that it's not a good card. It is. The way I kind of look at these Entwine cards is, let's look at the lowest possible threshold for this card. The Entwine cost here is a measly one. So for just one additional mana, you get both of these effects. Three mana for both of these is really, really good. And it just gets better depending on how many creatures or life you're willing to, you know, sacrifice in order to get the best benefit from this effect. So, like I was saying, the lowest possible floor for this. Let's say you sacrifice one creature, you gain three life, and you paid the entwine cost. For free, then, pretty much, you can look at the top three cards of your deck and put one of those into your hand, and you'll have to remove the rest from the game, sure. But with cards like Preordain and Ponder that are sort of the same as this, you're going to have to get rid of those other couple cards anyway, whether it's to the bottom of the deck or removed from the game, what have you. As you said, Stu, I like the fact that later in the game, especially when you really need an answer, this thing can get tremendous. And also having a pretty much two or three mana sack out, but for any number of creatures can also obviously be really, really good. So we will talk a lot about other cards of this cycle coming up in our money cards segment, tease that a little bit. But I'm going to go to my personal favorite, which is the black sorcery called Beacon of Unrest as my number five slot. So as I said, it costs five, three, and double black. It is a sorcery. You put target artifact or creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control, shuffle Beacon of Unrest into its owner's library. Now, before I tackle the rest of this card, just know that the real money here is the shuffling of the card into your deck so you can reuse it. I really won't go into why that's so good. I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with how good that can be by now. But just think about the power of putting any artifact or any creature from anyone's graveyard into play under your control. That's a pretty sweet ability. If it was just creatures, this might be slightly overcosted. But let's think about all the broken artifacts this thing can get back, not least of which might be something like, say, Door to Nothingness. I think the versatility that this card gives us to allow us to play with both dead creatures and dead artifacts gives it a power that Black doesn't normally have, and the best comparison I can come up with is Geth, Lord of the Vault, the actual creature card that sort of salvages other people's creatures and artifacts. 
but that's just other people too. This one can do both. So just for the versatility and reusable power that this card brings to the table, it definitely made my list without a question. We do see cards like Reanimate or Animate Dead, which are very, very powerful cards, especially in a lot of decks, hence the hefty price on Reanimate. But the real key thing about this, which is that most of these cards that Black has don't bring back artifacts, or they don't put them into play. The only one I can think of is in the newest Kaladesh set, where we have the black card that returns a creature to your hand and or an artifact to your hand. Typically, black has a lot of problems recurring artifacts, and being able to do so with this is really, really powerful. And like you said prior, Kyle, shuffling this back into the deck makes it so that you can get value out of this again. So if there's something that just happens to be good at that moment, play this, and you can have the chance of getting it again. So what it does is it doesn't make you as reserved of a player, so you can now get value when you need it, and get it again later. Well, I don't really have too much more to say about that, but I see we have yet another black card coming up on your list. Yes, and this is one I'm ordering because I can't believe I haven't seen it before, and I didn't know about it before. It is called Devour in Shadows, and it costs double black. It's an instant that says destroy target creature. It can't be regenerated. Also, you lose life equal to that creature's toughness. Now, we see a lot of kill spells in black, so what makes this one so special? Well, the obvious point being is that it destroys target creature. It doesn't have to say the clause, it can't be an artifact creature, or it can't be a black creature. Now, Doomblade is a black kill spell staple that you see in a lot of decks. And the reason that's in there is because for two mana, you remove a problem. But it has the clause that's a problem saying that you can't hit every target you want to hit. But this thing gets around that. The only thing is the problem is you lose power to its toughness. Now, arguably in Commander, that wouldn't be a big deal. But I can see how in certain other formats like Modern or Standard, where this could have been something niche that would have held people back from using it. But in all fairness, this card should be played a lot more in Mono Black or any other combination of Black just because of its pure versatility. Yeah, again, I really like this card as well, Stu. The only reason that I don't play this more is because normally I'm looking for multicolor options such as a Terminate, which does basically the same thing as this, but for one more color of mana, or a Dreadbore, which has the ability to destroy any creature or even any Planeswalker, albeit at sorcery speed. That said, though, this is a perfectly serviceable removal spell. It has a number of things going for it, one being, as you said, destroy any creature. Also, that little clause, it can't be regenerated. Regeneration has been kind of written out of the picture recently in Magic, but there are still some very good creatures out there that are widely played that can regenerate. So having that little thing on there might not always be so bad. Also, the fact that you lose life equal to its toughness can be sort of dangerous if you're taking out a big creature. But as you said, if you're in a game like Commander where you have a ton of life, not necessarily that bad. And also, the added bonus of if you're playing really this kind of powerful removal spell, odds are that you're going to be able to follow it up with something good. And so the losing of life may not be all that bad in retrospect. However, moving on to my number four here, this is a card that you pretty much see everywhere, so it is slightly boring to be on my list, I know, but I just had to mention it. It's Vidalcan Orrery. So if you're not familiar with this card already, it costs four, and it's an artifact, so it's colorless. You can cast non-land cards as though they had flash. You may be more familiar with the more modern incarnation of this Leyline of Anticipation, which is confined to blue. However, Vidalcan Orrery was the very first card that really had this kind of ability to grant flash to pretty much everything, and I'm sure I don't have to go into too much detail about what a powerful ability that is. Giving sorceries instant speed makes most board wipes into instance, which is amazing. Gives all your creatures flash as well. That's amazing, too. You can even flash in enchantments and artifacts and planeswalkers and really anything you want. You see these kinds of effects, like I said, on later things like the Leyline and also the land card, Alchemist's Refuge. And it's just an ode to how lastingly powerful this card was to set the template for this kind of effect. Having flash on things that don't have flash give you a huge land side advantage compared to other players. 
I've always been in between myself with the debate of which one's better, Vidalkin Ori or Leyline of Anticipation. And the fact that those two are so comparable to each other really gives you an idea of like how big of an advantage that is. For decks that are kind of slow or clunky, throw this in, you don't have that problem anymore. And the good thing about it is it's purely colorless. Any deck can have this advantage. And it's not too uncommon to see a person who has this in play just to simply pass their turn. Untap lands, go to you. You don't need to have an answer. If anything, you just need to play smart when this card's out, and you will be able to find a victory. I'm going to talk about a card that I foreshadowed from prior. At my number four spot, we have a card called Joiner Adept. Wink, wink. It costs two mana, a colorless and a green, and it in fact is a 2-1. It's an elf druid, which sometimes matters in certain decks, but it reads very simply, lands you control, have tap, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So this effectively makes it so it fixes all your mana color problems, which is really, really good. Like I said before with Door to Nothingness, you would typically see a card or a card effect similar to this to make that card pop and make a player lose the game. Now, I don't have to go into too much of why fixing mana colors is really big. That's why you see a lot of fetch lands in decks to make it so that if they're having problems, it gets rid of that to its full entirety. And that's why Chromatic Lantern is also a card you see in so many decks. Even if it's just a two-color deck, it's not uncommon to see it in there. This is just another option, and it makes it so that green has it, and green has it at a low cost, which is kind of rare considering most green effects that are very powerful cost a lot of mana. It's my considered opinion that this card is about as close to a creature version of Chromatic Lantern as we're ever going to get. Chromatic Lantern is pretty much a staple in commander and even casual formats as well just for the amount of mana fixing that it does while joiner adept isn't able to tap for mana itself as you said it gives all the lands you control the ability to tap for any color even the ones that could only make colorless before for example so if you were having color issues you're not going to have them anymore i also should note that for a two mana two one that's pretty good stats for a card like this. I would not have faulted them if they made this a 1-1 one -one for 2 mana with this kind of ability, but a 2-1, slightly more aggressive, not all that terrible stats, and Elf, a very, very relevant creature type, which gives it a home in a lot of different decks. But a really fun fact that gets something extra in this is lands that don't produce mana now produce mana. So fetch lands you don't produce can produce. Or even if you think of Cabal Coffers, you need to put two mana into it, you no longer have to. So if you have the mana you need, it can give you an additional boost, even though in fact it doesn't produce mana. Yeah, that's absolutely true, Stu. And like you said, it being a creature possibly makes it even more useful in Chromatic Lantern for green decks, because they have a lot easier time tutoring for creatures than they do for artifacts. Which kind of leads me in a very nice segue into my next card. At number three on the list, we have another... Very simple card, but a very powerful one. It's called Steel Shaper's Gift, and this is a one-mana white sorcery. It simply says, search your deck for an equipment card, reveal that card, and put it into your hand. Then, shuffle your deck. Now, it should be noted that equipments were new to this original Mirrodin block, which started with Mirrodin, continued with Dark Steel, and ended in, here we are, Fifth Dawn. Equipments were very, very new at the time. There are some good ones, for sure, in the Mirrodin block, but when this card was designed, people had no idea how insane equipments would eventually get. There are some really busted ones out there. Batter Skull primarily leaps to mind. Something like Argentum Armor, Umazawa's Jeet, and for one mana, you can get any single one of them to right to your hand. Of course, there are cards, I think, over time that have kind of outclassed this one. Open the Armory, for example, can search for more things. Stoneforge Mystic is a creature that basically does this and can also help you cheat high-costed equipments into play. But there's no beating the classics, and for one mana, the ability to tutor up any kind of card even if it's narrow, is pretty darn solid. And given that equipments are a very relevant type of card that are just going to get better and more relevant with the course of time, this should always be a consideration if you're playing a lot of equipments in your deck. It's a turn one play. And anything that's a turn one play is always very good. But it's even better than that because this is good turn one or turn 10. It puts it instantly into your hand. So for a card like Enlightened Tutor, which searches for an artifact or an enchantment and it puts it to the top of your deck, it isn't as good for the fact that if you need an answer right then and right now, it doesn't get that answer for you. 
And like Kyle said before, there are tons and tons of powerful artifacts that every deck wants to use. So for me, moving from one thing that can find artifacts to another artifact, if you couldn't tell, this was a very artifact heavy set. We have a card called Summoner's Egg. It costs four colorless and it is a 0-4 artifact creature. Little funky, huh? But it has the effect to imprint. Now when you cast this card, you remove a card from your hand from the game face down. When Summoner's Egg is put into a graveyard from play, turn the imprinted face down card face up. If that card is a creature card, Put it into play under your control. Artifacts, powerful. Artifacts that can cheat stuff into play for free, even more powerful. But not only that, you can recur this so easily it is ridiculous. This is almost like Jora, where like you exile a card from your hand and you get into play whenever. But there are ways to sacrifice artifacts to get additional value. There's ways to be able to make this thing recur for itself from the graveyard. It just can be so easily broken that it'll make your opponents have to exile it. And a card that has to be exiled is always a great card to have. I think this is an interesting card. Maybe not overtly powerful, but an interesting card nonetheless. I think later cards, perhaps like Prototype Portal or even one that came before this one, like Soul Foundry, for example, kind of do this effect one better in that they can be used repeatedly, maybe a little bit more easily. Also, if you get this card as a top deck late in the game, if you have no creatures in your hand, you're going to be really, really sad. That said, I kind of like this card. It's obviously very easy to use and abuse correctly in that how many things out there allow you to sacrifice artifacts or creatures? I mean, come on. And when you play this thing out and... Let's just, for the sake of argument, name something ridiculous like a Blightsteel Colossus. If you are able to cheat something like that into play on turn four or five using something like this, you're going to be having a good time. Not only that, it makes it so if this is on the field and they don't have flyers or any kind of evasion, they don't want to attack you. The fear of the unknown is the greatest thing. Like, even if you don't have the Blightsteel, people will be terrified that you do. You can put a Sakura Tribe Elder under this. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but it's just the whole mind games tactics to be like, hey, you can board wipe, which means I get my thing, and it'll be on the field, and it will be the only creature on the field. So it's really, really something. Well, kind of going along with this subject of cheating things into play, let's talk about one of my very favorite cards from this set, and another one that I think is criminally overlooked as a both a budget option and just as an overall good card. It's called Acquire. It's a blue sorcery that costs five mana to play, three and double blue. And you search target opponent's library for any artifact card and put that card into play under your control. The card that this immediately draws comparisons to for me is Bribery from way back in Mercadian Mask. We've actually talked about that card before. But also to the creature Thada Adele Acquisitor, which has the ability to steal an artifact from your opponent's deck every time it hits them for combat damage. That being said, neither of these cards necessarily have the ability to put an artifact into play for free. Bribery could if it was an artifact creature, but again, it would have to be a creature, not just a non-creature artifact. And let's be clear, there are plenty of dumb non-creature artifacts that you can take from other people. A door to nothingness, for example. Even something more innocuous, like a conjurer's closet, which I've stolen many a time from other people and has never failed to be useful. This is basically a budget bribery. And while bribery commands quite a price tag historically, this card, less than a dollar. And I think, again, this card is criminally overlooked as an option that almost any blue deck would be really happy to have. I do like this card a lot, Kyle, but there is one scenario that I always have fear of when I try to run it into a deck, and it's that, yes, a lot of decks do run artifacts, but not every deck runs the right artifact for you. So meaning that some decks, they run the very minimum, an equipment, a soul ring, a Wayfarer's Bauble, for example, but not all key cards in their decks are going to be artifacts. So you really do have to be cautious about when you're trying to play this. Because, I mean, five mana for an enemy soul ring is nice. But at that late in the game, you might want something with a little bit more power to it. I admit, this card can sometimes be hit or miss, as all these kind of theft-related cards can be. But 
even in your scenario, Stu, stealing an enemy soul ring, if that's the absolute bottom floor of this card's power level, that's still not that bad in my opinion. I also think that this card is valuable because in terms of bribery and being able to get a more relevant type, which is creatures, many of the best creatures in the game are artifact creatures. Therefore, Acquire covers both of those bases, and I could make the argument that it might be a better card. Now moving from a tutor for artifacts, I'm going to go to the final artifact card on my list. And again, if I saw this in a deck, I would probably use Acquire to make it so they couldn't get it. It's a three-drop artifact called Fist of Suns. And this card reads, you may pay one of each color rather than pay the mana cost for the spell that you want to play. This is huge. Now, the reason why this is so big is because it now gets around all mana costs for every card, if you decide to. Now, there's a cycle of cards called the Bringers, which we see in Fifth Dawn, um, that have an alternative casting cost on them in which you can either pay their mana cost, which is exorbitant, or you can go ahead and pay one of each color. So you can get something that's very overpowered for five mana. But also, this can work for a commander. So, I mean, obviously you would want to use this for a five-color deck. But if you think about the five-color creatures out there that you could use as a commander, they typically cost one of each color as is. But the one that I really enjoy using this with is Progenitus, which means instead of having to wait till turn 10, maybe even later if you don't have the right colors, you now only have to wait till turn 5. You have a 10-10 out with protection from everything, and it can also make it so it can win by commander damage way sooner. But there's also a huge amount of cards that do cost a lot of mana. So if you are running a five color deck, it gets around all their costs. I have nightmares about seeing this card in commander and seeing Progenitus come down on turn five or earlier. It's bad. I mean, it's great, but it's bad, but it's great. Anyway, Fist of Sons, I don't have too much to add to this other than the fact that as you said, very, very specific in the kind of deck it is useful in, but for those kinds of decks, aka ones that play all five colors, it can be an absolute house and a game changer. Going to my number one, I picked a card that I think, while its power level may not be quite as obvious as something like Fist of Suns, the ceiling is just as high and again, part of the reason I picked it is because it really reframed the game of Magic as we know it today. So for my number one pick of Fifth Dawn, it is this innocuous little creature called Trinket Mage. It is a three-drop creature in blue of a relevant creature type in that it's a human wizard, and it costs two and one blue for a 2-2 body. Not too bad. When it enters the battlefield, you may search your deck for an artifact card with converted mana cost one or less, reveal that card, and put it into your hand. Now, looking back at a card that I previously talked about, like Salvaging Station, you may say to me, why is a card like this ranked more highly than Salvage Station where there are potentially infinite combos to explore? The reason being that Trinket Mage has made a splash pretty much everywhere in Magic. It's played everywhere, from Commander, to modern decks, to even older formats like Legacy and onward. Trinket Mage has become a staple of many, many places just for the amazing kind of versatility that it offers. Think about this card and what it can get for you. It can grab a Soul Ring out of your deck. It can grab any one of the Spell Bombs or Capsule cards that cost one mana. It can get the aforementioned Wayfarer's Bauble. It grabs an Altar of the Brood in my Lazav deck almost every single time. There are just so many insanely good things that cost one mana that you can search for with this card. It gives a nice, reasonable body at a reasonable rate with a pretty awesome tutor effect. And like I said, one that has made a splash in almost every conceivable format. It's just that good. Especially in Commander, when somebody has the epic turn of playing Soul Ring on the very beginning, you already are at a huge disadvantage. Waiting around a little bit to turn three to be able to get that Soul Ring just to catch up to them is huge. Now, granted, you might be behind, but you're not as behind as you could have been. So this really stakes it up a whole other notch. Plus, also, if nobody has their Soul Ring, you now get that lead. It takes you from turn three to turn six, and that is enormous. Another trick of this card to keep in mind is that, remember, artifacts that cost X and only X are technically zero, even if there's more than one X in their mana cost. This thing can now search up the likes of Chalice of the Void, 
Walking Ballista, Astral Cornucopia, Hangerback Walker, the list goes on and on. Not only that, there's a whole cycle of artifact lands. So if you had the Soul Ring and you're still hurting for mana, by God, get it. Like, grab the land, make it your land drop for a turn. Or even grab an expedition map. Like, that makes it so you get any land you possibly need. The versatility on this card is incredible. It's a fun card, and it is a great card at that. But I see for your number one, Stu, we also have a blue card. We do. And actually, I'm going to break the mold from artifacts and go into the realm of enchantments. This one is, as well, a three drop, two colorless and a blue, for a card called Eyes of the Watcher. Whenever you play an instant or sorcery, you may pay one, and if you do, scry two. Now, the reason I like this card over a lot of the other cards that I have listed, or that you have listed, Kyle, is, like you said, it has a very decent cost, and it's not a big deal. But it's very similar to Ristic Study. And for those of you who do know Ristic Study and those who don't, it is a very powerful card that makes it so that you get an advantage with very small costs. So whenever you play an instant or sorcery, which you're in blue, is very easy to do. You play an Aether Spout, you play a Cyclonic Rift, you play a Ponder or a Brainstorm. You pay one extra, you scry two for nothing more. You get to pretty much have not card advantage, but card knowledge advantage, and that is very, very big. Being able to plan two moves ahead of your opponent is always going to put you ahead. It's the reason why we see cards like Sensei's Divining Top or Scroll Rack have the cost that they do, because it does that, but it can be continuous over and over again. Yeah, Scrying has definitely withstood the test of time as a very, very powerful and yet understated ability that I think everybody loves and can get behind. This was actually very, very close to making my list as well, but the reason it didn't is because I think in the years since Fifth Dawn has been around, a basically better version of this card has been printed, and that would be Chase's Sanctum. Now, to spoil that card a bit, it costs four, so one more than Eyes of the Watcher, but it also makes all of your instants and sorceries just straight up cost one colorless less to play. And in addition, whenever you play an instant or sorcery, you get to scry one a little bit less, but totally for free. You don't have to pay an extra one mana. I think we could have a very spirited debate about which one of these cards is better. And I think, frankly, that Jace's Sanctum is the better card. But I do have to say, scrying two rather than just scrying one can be infinitely more powerful. So... I don't know, honestly, which one is better, but I still like either card, and Eyes of the Watcher certainly very good justification for this being on top of your list. Yes, Jace's Sanctum is arguably better, but if you're running that one, you're definitely going to want more than one copy of that, and like I said, Commander is a singleton format. Why not run something that's very similar? I would love to personally have both of these on the field at the same time and just see at how much more value I get over everyone. Like, it's just enormous. Like, blue draws cards, and yes, drawing cards or scrying. Now, that's a tough fight right there, but being able to consistently do it with whatever little mana you're not using, it gets you more bang for your buck. Like, all right, you're at turn three, you're going to play something as, like, reserve counterspell or something like that. Why not get a little more value? This way you know, like, all right, I'm prepared, or no, I'm not prepared, or I need to hold this card up, or I really need to hope for something. It, it's just something that can really make you get an edge from losing the game to surviving or surviving to winning. This is our pool time for today, so if the water felt just right for you, be sure to check out our following episode in which we talk about the top 10 money cards from Fifth Dawn. And if you didn't like the toys we played with today, be sure to tell us your favorites from Fifth Dawn in the comments down below. If that's not your style, you can also tweet us at mtgthecardpool or email us at mtgthecardpool at gmail.com. I'm Kyle Robertson. And I'm Stu Galetta, and we'll see you next time at The Card Pool.